Already in 2012, there have been six separate pieces of legislation submitted to state legislatures, and we have every reason to believe that there will be one later on this week from the um, uh, state of Tennessee. Um, there's a variety of bills that have been sub submitted. Uh, most of them, all of them deal with evolution to some degree. Some of them also deal with uh, global warming, origin of life, cloning, and some of the other so-called controversial issues. Um, and the legislative season is not yet done. Let me digress for just a moment and talk a little bit about evolution itself, because what I find when I give public presentations, um, and especially on morning talk shows and things like that, people really don't understand what, what evolution is. I had an acquaintance who was a physical anthropologist, which is my area of training. Uh, she taught in a southeastern state in a community college, and uh, she had students in her class who had never been taught evolution. Uh, their teachers had just sort of skipped those chapters uh, in high school. And, of course, this was college, and this was physical anthropology, so, of course, you just sail right into it. I mean, that's what we do from day one. Uh, it's not controversial at all at the university level. And after a couple of weeks, uh, she told me that a couple of these guys came up to her, and, and they were, well, of course species change through time. You mean that's evolution? They, they really didn't know. One of them said, we thought evolution meant you can't believe in God. I heard many variants of that story from high school teachers, college professors, um, and I've had variants of that story actually told to me personally. So let's talk briefly about what evolution is from the standpoint of a scientist. Well, I think evolution is best understood as a three-part idea. The big idea of evolution is common ancestry. Living things have descended with modification from common ancestors. <clears throat> Evolutionary biologists study this common ancestry phenomenon in two ways. One way that they study it is by looking at the mechanisms or the factors that bring about evolution, and obviously natural selection is the most important of these. There are other mechanisms or factors that affect evolution. Uh, there's non-selective means, there's speciation, there's a lot of different components to uh, the mechanisms or processes that affect evolution. We also study evolution by looking at the pattern of evolution. How does the tree of life branch through time? The big idea, the pattern, and the process are three largely independent components of the modern biological explanation of evolution. When Darwin came up with the idea of evolution by natural selection, um, he found that he was, he, he quite readily convinced the scientific community about common ancestry. That was accepted within a decade, everybody got on that bandwagon. The idea of natural selection was harder for him to, to convince his colleagues of. And part of that reason was because um, there was this flaw in natural selection. Natural selection requires new variation every generation to act upon. And at the time of 1859, 60s, 70s, 80s, at the last half of the um, 1800s, nothing accurate was known about genetics, frankly. There, there really wasn't a good understanding of where that, what we call today, genetic variation came every single generation. Well, now we know a lot more about sources of variation. We know a lot more about genetics. And knowing this genetic underpinning means that the, uh, the natural selection explanation is one that really works. And so now not only are scientists on board about the big idea of common ancestry, they're also on board in terms of the mechanism of natural selection. And obviously we still have plenty of things to learn about the processes of evolution and this research continues. But we've got the basic outlines pretty well. Similarly, we have the basic outlines of the pattern of evolution, of, of how the tree of life has branched through time. Still have plenty more to learn, but we've got the big ideas. I mean, we, we understand a lot about the basics. And it's lovely to fill in the, uh, the details, certainly. The big idea, the pattern, and the process, the three components of uh, evolutionary biology, have different inferences and different sources of data that are used to explain them. So 
in fact, even in on the origin of species, Darwin used um, one set of, of observations and inferences to support the idea of common ancestry. He used a different set of observations, experiments, and inferences to support the idea of natural selection. These are these are basically conceptually distinct. Uh, as it happened, Darwin didn't really know very much about the patterns of evolution. Not much was known about the fossil record. Uh, it was pretty much just inferred from um, comparative anatomy and comparative embryology. Now we have biochemistry. We have a lot more in the fossil record, and we have a lot better understanding of how the, the tree of life is shaped. But paleontologists who, who, and embryologists who study um, reconstruction of the phylogenies or the patterns of evolution um, are using a different set of observations, experiments, and inferences than the people who study the mechanisms. So the big idea of the pattern and the process are three independent components of this theory. The reason why that's uh, useful to, to recognize or useful to think about is that when it comes to the actual research that is done at this institution or any other university, you will find that the biology and geology faculty are not questioning, are not testing whether or not living things have common ancestors. That inference is so well supported that it's no longer a matter of contention. What we do argue about a lot, and what you'll find scientists uh, debating and contending and writing articles about and going to conferences and fighting about, you will find a lot of debate and discussion about the pattern and process issues. That's where the active scientific research is going on. But those are the details. And in terms of my work at the National Center for Science Education, in terms of, of looking at the people who oppose evolution, they're not really talking about the pattern and process. They're talking about the big idea. But many times what they will do is look at the arguments among scientists about pattern or process and say, oh, scientists are disagreeing about whether uh, birds and dinosaurs um, uh, whether, whether dinosaurs gave rise to birds or whether dinosaurs and birds had a more distant common ancestor. Therefore, evolution didn't take place. And that's a category error because you're taking, in, this, in that example, you're taking a pattern argument and trying to apply it to the big idea to which it is not relevant. So most of the contention at the school board level or at the, the laws that I showed you that uh, get proposed every year at state legislatures, that's all about the big idea. That's all about questioning whether or not living things have common ancestors. But I assure you that at this university and at all the other uh, institutions of higher learning in not only Michigan, but in other states as well, this is not a matter that is being actively debated. Uh, common ancestry works extremely well to explain a great deal of biology. And so that is why the uh, concern is so high among scientists, especially biologists and geologists, that evolution be taught at the K-12 level. Now, some of you may be aware that NCSD defends not only evolution education, but recently we got into defending climate change as well. One reporter, when we announced this a couple of months ago, said, oh, so the frying pan wasn't hot enough, was it? And so we're taking on climate change as well. And as such, we've done a lot of thinking about why people reject scientific ideas and how to describe this rejection. I talked in more detail about this this afternoon. But the pillars of denial, which uh, are applicable actually to evolution denial as well as to gl uh, global warming denial, uh, and you could very likely extend it to things like um, uh, denial of uh, you know, the, the anti-vaccination people. I mean, any sort of controversy where um, the consensus view of science is being challenged probably could, the arguments could probably be fit into one of these three categories. Uh, the first, of course, is to challenge the science, challenge the validity of the science. It's claimed that the science is unsettled or weak. The second is an ideological pillar where evolution or global warming must be rejected because it's not compatible with some ideological view. Obviously, with evolution, the ideological view is conservative Christian religion. And finally, the third pillar is a cultural pillar in which uh, arguments are made against the science based upon not science itself, but based upon American values of 
in, in the case of evolution of free speech, of um, uh, letting students receive all views and uh, critically think their way into a conclusion and so forth. Now, I'm going to be talking tonight primarily about the second two of these, simply because there's not time for everything. Um, so let's talk a little bit about history. <clears throat> At the time of the Scopes trial in 1925, featuring William Jennings Bryan on the left, excuse me, on the right, and Clarence Darrow on the left, they were certainly the most famous political figures of their day. Uh, the ideological reasons for opposing evolution were clear. And the opposition came in two forms, corresponding, uh, really, to the big idea of evolution and to the uh, mechanism of natural selection. <clears throat> During the time of Scopes, natural selection was viewed very negatively. Uh, Modern-day uh, creationists, by the way, accept natural selection. Of course, natural selection works. We have um, <clears throat> antibiotic resistance of bacteria. We have uh, resistance of crops to herbicides. I mean, it's clear. There's so much evidence for natural selection. Creationists accept natural selection, as do people, who, uh, scientists who accept evolution. But during the time of Scopes, uh, 1925, this really was before the discovery of the genetic underpinnings of evolution, uh, of natural selection. And, and natural selection was being misused in some very profound ways. It was being used to support lazy affair capitalism, things like sweatshops, things like child labor. And in fact, um, uh, robber barons like uh, Andrew Carnegie um, uh, would quite explicitly tie the, uh, what we would consider very harsh uh, approaches to uh, treatment of, of labor and so forth by justifying it with natural selection. Uh, in this quotation, he says, while the law of competition may be sometimes hard for the individual, it is best for the race, because it ensures the survival of the fittest in every department. Um, so when William Jennings Bryan opposed the teaching of evolution, uh, he wasn't making this up. I mean, evolution really was being used in this very negative way to promote some social ideas that were very negative. This was social Darwinism which was very much confused with the scientific idea of evolution. This history is exploited by modern creationists in movies like Ben Stein's Expelled and in several recent books that have claimed that evolution is inherently racist, it's the source of eugenics, it's the source of Nazism and the like. If you go to the Expelled website, uh, you will find this um, uh, statement, and I'll blow it up for you so you don't have to squint. Evolution leads to atheism, leads to eugenics, leads to the Holocaust and Nazi Germany. This is, to be charitable, a simplification. Um, evolution does not inevitably lead to atheism. Uh, the eugenic story is far more complex than presented in this website. Eugenics is a very interesting, has a very interesting history. Most of the intellectuals of the late 19th and early 20th century were caught up in this enthusiasm of eugenics. People like Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson were great uh, supporters of the idea of eugenics. In England, you had Winston Churchill, H.G. Wells, Maynard Keynes, George Bernard Shaw. Uh, there was a great enthusiasm for especially positive eugenics, getting people with good genetic material, good heredity uh, to meet each other and have offspring, and this would be good for the, for the species. Some of the most prominent eugenicists were Christians, and Christian churches seeing, saw eugenics as a way of bettering life for the poor. Now, we would consider these views misguided today, and in fact, the Methodist church uh, has done so publicly to its credit. Protestant churches concerned with social welfare, particularly the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and the Episcopalians, embraced eugenics. Uh, Methodist churches around the country promoted the American Eugenic Society fitter family contests, uh, wherein the fittest family just tended to be you know, tall and blonde and rich. Uh, somehow that was an indication of their, uh, their, their fitter qualities, I guess. 
Uh, the Methodist bishops endorsed one of the first books church, uh, circulated to U.S. churches promoting eugenics. And unlike the battles over evolution and creation, both conservative denominations as well as what would be considered liberal denominations embraced eugenics. And this is the United Methodist Church's apology for its previous support of eugenics. So the idea that evolution leads to eugenics, eugenics is a very complex problem. Uh, it has had a very complex history, and many people at the turn of the century were misled into thinking that these ideas were a valid way to help the poor, as well as people like Andrew Carnegie, who, saw, who thought, thought that you know, laissez-faire capitalism would benefit from not just natural selection, but also eugenics. So it's a much more complicated situation than is presented simplistically by creationists. Creationists are also very fond of, oh, I'm sorry, a fuller discussion of the claims of the link between evolution, eugenics, and Nazism can be found on NCSE's website uh, that we constructed a few years ago to um, deal with this uh, awful movie, uh, expelledexposed.com. You can find more information about that. Now, creationists are very fond of quoting Darwin as... Um, making him sound like someone who favored social Darwinism and favored eugenics. Uh, they are very, very good at quoting out of context. Now, I will apologize to you because I think that it is PowerPoint abuse to present big, long quotes to people in an audience, but I can't work around this. So I apologize to you for giving you this big, long quote. With savages, the weak in body or mind are soon eliminated. We civilized men, on the other hand, do our utmost to check the process of elimination. We build asylum for the imbeciles, the maimed, and the sick. Thus, the weak members of civilized societies propagate their kind. No one who has attended to the breeding of domestic animals will doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of man. Hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. Well, that doesn't make them sound very enlightened, does it? Creationists are very good at stopping there. But there's another paragraph that better reflects Darwin's views about this situation. The aid which we feel impelled to give to the helpless is mainly an incidental result of the instinct of sympathy, which was originally acquired as part of the social instincts, but subsequently rendered, in the manner previously indicated, more tender and more widely diffused. Nor could we check our sympathy, if so urged by hard reason, without deterioration of the noblest part of our nature. So Darwin is saying, of course we're going to take care of the sick and the maim and the unhealthy and the imbeciles and things like that, because we would not be fully human if we did. So, you know, the idea that Darwin was some sort of eugenicist doesn't match what Darwin wrote in most of his um, uh, 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 writings. If you cherry pick certain statements, well, you can, you know, you can get people that say just about anything. Darwin came from a very long tradition of anti-slavery. Not just the Darwin family, but the Wedgwood family as well, which, of course, the Darwin and Wedgwood families had inter, uh, intermarried for a couple of generations. But both were staunch anti-slavery um, proponents. They both, both the Wedgwood and the Darwin families donated to the uh, northern um, uh, uh, efforts during the Civil War. Uh, they supported um, uh, English suffrage organizations that, that uh, English anti-slavery organizations that worked to rid the British colonies of slavery. Um, in fact, when Darwin was on the voyage of the Beagle, uh, traveling around the world, you all probably know the basic outlines of Darwin's uh, story. He almost got put off the boat by Fitzroy because he and Fitzroy had this big argument in Brazil when uh, Darwin had the temerity of suggesting that, well, perhaps the, the slaves of the Brazilian uh, host where they were having dinner were happy and smiley because they were slaves, and if they were free people, they might have a different opinion about their service. And... Um, Fitzroy, and, and he almost uh, almost came to a parting of the ways. Um, there's many references in Darwin's correspondence about his anti-slavery views. Now, I'm not trying to make Darwin some little homunculus of a 20th century liberal. He wasn't. Uh, he had views that uh, you know, 
are, are, would not be considered uh, appropriate today. But by, you know, but by no means was he a racist, was he a eugenicist, or many of these claims that are, are placed at his doorstep. I think it's worth noting that ideologues will seize upon any powerful idea to push their agenda. Science happens to be a very powerful set of ideas, and it's not surprising that ideologues will seize science to promote their cause. Evolution is a powerful scientific idea. It is not a surprise that ideologues will utilize evolution to promote their point of view. Andrew Carnegie used evolution by natural selection to support capitalism. <clears throat> Henry Wallace was a socialist. He supported his views through natural selection. Peter Kropotkin argued for anarchy using evolution and natural selection, whereas Vernon Kellogg <clears throat> argued for pacifism. Capitalism, socialism, anarchy, and pacifism, are they all supported by natural selection? Or perhaps are we seeing ideologues picking what components of this powerful idea they feel would best allow them to promote their views? Uh, the idea that somehow or another Hitler was inspired by evolution it particularly makes no sense. Um, there are no references to Darwin uh, in Mein Kampf, uh, far more references, unfortunately, to Christianity. Um, Nazi ideas of the inherent superiority of the Aryan race uh, doesn't work with natural selection at all. Natural selection argues for superiority, if you will, adaptedness of a particular group at a particular place and time. There's no such thing as an overall superior group within a species, which of course is the whole shtick about uh, uh, Nazi uh, Aryan superiority. And anyway, Hitler didn't know very much about science anyway. He was a very poorly educated man. It's questionable whether he even knew anything about Darwin at all. Modern creationists, as I mentioned, tend to be more accepting of natural selection, but they do reject the idea of common ancestry. Uh, this is true of traditional creationists, as well as being true of intelligent design proponents. It's especially clear in the literature of the traditional or young earth creationists. Conservative Christians hold that the Bible is the word of God and is without error. Genesis must be interpreted literally with creation taking place in six 24-hour days. The Bible's parts are also closely connected. As in this cartoon from Answers in Genesis, the whole Bible has to be viewed as a seamless web, and if Genesis isn't true, the whole thing unravels. Genesis is also viewed as the source of all morality and goodness. And evolution, because it is not, in fact, compatible with their interpretation of Genesis, is therefore the source of all that is bad. So children must be protected against learning evolution lest they abandon their faith. And according to this theological view, two, things, two bad things happen when children cease to believe in God. The idea is that if you accept evolution, you have to give up your faith in God. If you give up your faith in God, two bad things will happen. One is that you will lose your moral compass. If you teach a child they come from an animal, they will act like an animal, said one very famous creationist from Texas. These are all illustrations uh, from various creationist websites, this one from Answers in Genesis. <clears throat> Oops, sorry, go back. Uh, Henry Morris was uh, once, um, once wrote uh, in The Twilight of Evolution that evolution is at the foundation of communism, fascism, Freudianism, social Darwinism, behaviorism, Kinseyism, materialism, atheism, and in the religious world, modernism and neo-orthodoxy. Jesus said, a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit. In view of the bitter fruit yielded by the evolutionary system over the past hundred years, a closer look at the nature of the tree itself is well warranted today. Creationist literature is chock full of trees of evil like this one, where all the evils of society have their foundation in evolution. So if you get rid of evolution, then the moral order will be restored. The second result of a child losing faith in God is even worse for parents to contemplate, and this is the loss of the child to salvation. A child who loses faith in God will not go to heaven and not be reunited with Jesus and his loved one. And this is a very serious issue. Um, no one wants to uh, have their child be removed forever, if that is their theology. 
So conservative Christians are highly motivated to protect children from evolution, which they consider a highly toxic set of ideas. And let me tell you just a little bit about modern-day creationists. Henry Morris uh, is the 20th century's most important anti-evolutionist. He was the author of scores of books on creation science, which is not just the biblical idea of special creation, um, but that there is scientific evidence to support and prove the Bible's literal version of special creation. Um, after disappearing from the curriculum after Scopes, evolution was creeping back into the curriculum in the 1960s when Henry Morris began developing creation science. Now remember, this is supposedly a scientific view. It's not just a religious view. It's a, they called it creation science because they firmly believed that scientific data supported the special creationist view. One of the uh, factors in young earth creationism founded by Henry Morris is flood geology. The explanation of all of the geological features of the planet Earth as a result of Noah's flood. Uh, and this would include the Colorado Plateau, the Grand Canyon, the cutaway uh, sediments uh, of which, uh, stratigraphy that I show you here. Now, they have to be able to explain all sedimentary deposits as a result of catastrophic geology, especially the flood. Everything from Grand Canyon to the Himalayas. So the creationist view of the Colorado Plateau is the Grand Canyon is pre-flood and early flood. And then when you get off into uh, areas like um, Zion uh, and Bryce Canyon, those are late flood and post-flood. Um, that is how Grand Canyon was laid down and the rest of the Colorado Plateau. How Grand Canyon was cut also had to be catastrophic because, remember, these are young Earth creationists. It's very important for the Earth to be young. If the Earth is old, then they lose the game right away. Uh, if the Earth is young, evolution loses because there's not enough time if the Earth is only uh, thousands of years old rather than billions. So catastrophic geological deposition, Remember, the, the ark uh, floated around for almost a year before the flood water settled, so all of the sediments of Grand Canyon settled out in a period of a year. And then Grand Canyon was cut catastrophically by a large body of water that was impounded, uh, something like Glacial Lake Missoula, if you know anything about the Channel Scanlands up there in, in Washington. There was a break in, the, uh, in a, a dam that was... Um, a natural dam that was holding back this water, and a phenomenal amount of water, six times the, the amount of water in the Great Lakes, uh, poured through and cut Grand Canyon catastrophically in a period of about a week. Now, this is kind of hard to support from a scientific standpoint. I mean, if you want to believe that God you know, did this miraculously and then just made it look like all the layers are there, that's fine. But if you want to try to support this scientifically and have that taught in school, then we have to talk. Then you have to uh, be able to, to defend your ideas, uh, show evidence for them, and explain other factors that are not explained by your model. And actually, there's a great deal of evidence against this and nothing in favor of it. If you want to know more about why Grand Canyon is not catastrophically deposited and not catastrophically cut, uh, consider coming on NCSC's Grand Canyon ref trip. Uh, we do this every summer and have an awfully good time talking about how creationists explain Grand Canyon versus how um, uh, geologists explain Grand Canyon. Uh, here we are looking at a, a really cool sandstone slab of coconut sandstone that fell off from a, um, uh, an upper level of the canyon close to the river's edge there. And there's these, there's these cute little tetrapod tracks. They're only about this big, and they're sort of scattering all across there. And the creation model has to somehow explain a couple of funny things about this slab. For example, how you got a water-laid slab, a wind-laid slab, and then another water-laid slab underneath that, if all of this took place in one year. That's kind of hard to explain. And then you also have to explain how you got footprints on this, this is water, this is um, aeolian or wind-laid sandstone. How you got footprints on this and uh, when another big halush of the flood came by, why this wasn't all washed away. Anyway, these are the sort of things we talk about, and it's a lot of fun. And it is Grand Canyon, so it's fabulous no matter what. So 
the young earth creationist model is pretty hard to sustain scientifically, and most Americans would sort of cock an eyebrow at this and say, you know, this doesn't sound, you know, creation science. You're explaining the Himalayas by Noah's flood. What is this? Um, but in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, within living memory of some of us here uh, with gray hair, um, efforts were made to pass laws requiring the teaching of creation science if you taught evolution. Uh, and 26 states, I think we counted, uh, had legislation proposed. Fortunately, only two states passed the legislation. And the, the uh, Supreme Court ruled in Edwards versus Aguilard that these equal time for creation science laws were unconstitutional. The way the First Amendment works, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause taken together mean that public institutions have to be religiously neutral. The courts have always decided that the teaching of creationism, the advocacy, okay, talking about any religious view is perfectly legal, but advocating a creationist view in the public schools is advancing religion. It is, it is violating that principle of neutrality that the First Amendment very wisely has enshrined in our Constitution. But even before the Edwards decision kind of put the kibosh on equal time laws in 1987, a lot of creationists were kind of losing confidence in uh, young earth creationism. It really wasn't appealing to uh, Catholics and mainstream Protestants. It really only appealed to biblical literalist Christians. And that's still a minority of Christians. So um, there was an effort by a number of uh, conservative Christians to try to come up with an alternative to evolution that you know, didn't really deal with the flood and, and some of the you know, crazier young earth uh, arguments that, that were just not very persuasive to the American public and that hopefully might be a little bit more legally bulletproof than uh, young earth creationists turned out to be. And what they hit upon was the core idea of creationism, which is the complexity of life as being a direct result of God's special creation. And this was very similar to an idea that had been proposed by a 19th century clergyman, William Paley. Now, in William Paley's argument from design in 1802, he, wrote, he gave an example of, let's say you're walking along a heath and you see a rock. You're not going to think twice about it. That rock could have been there for hundreds of thousands or who knows how many years that rock would have been there. It's a perfectly natural item. It's very simple, no big deal. But if you saw a pocket watch on the heath, you would notice that right away and notice that that was out of place because a pocket watch is an artifact. It's a, it's a, a product of human activity. Um, it has all these wires and springs and glass and steel and components that all taken together uh, are a purposeful arrangement of parts um, to quote Michael Behe, they, they are a purposeful arrangement of parts that allow you to tell time. And you would know from seeing that complex artifact on the heath that there had to be a watchmaker. Unlike the rock, which could have been there forever, you knew from seeing the watch because of its complexity, there had to be a watchmaker. And he argued similarly, if you look around in nature and you see something very complicated like the vertebrate eye, it has all these equivalent of wires and springs and components and nerves and uh, layers and lenses and all this kind of stuff. And you know that this couldn't possibly be a natural structure. You know that there had to have been an eye maker. So Paley's book um, on uh, natural, uh, natural theology, um, making the argument from design, was an apologetic. It was an argument for the existence of God based upon wonders of nature, based upon complexity of nature. Now, of course, I mentioned that Darwin's idea of natural selection um, initially wasn't accepted in the scientific community uh, until the genetic underpinnings got added in in the 20th century. But there was another reason why there was a pushback against natural selection. And this was more of a theological pushback. This was because what Darwin did in On the Origin of Species, through the explanation of natural selection. He came up with a natural way of building something complex like an eye. In fact, 
one of the really brilliant things that Darwin did in On the Origin of Species is he used the eye as an example of something that could be built through natural selection, through the gradual accumulation of complexity over time, through, this, through the adaptedness of, of various stages. Uh, he used the eye as an example because he knew everybody reading that book would be familiar with Paley's argument. And he was actually trying to undermine the idea that you had to explain complexity through miraculous cause. He felt that it was perfectly possible to explain complexity through natural causes, which is what natural selection does. This, of course, is intelligent design. This is the, um, the modern-day version of Paley's idea of complexity proving, uh, complexity requiring the uh, direct hand of God is what the intelligent design proponents today are talking about. Now, I always like to let people define their own area, their own field. So I'm going to let William Dembski define intelligent design. Uh, and William Dembski is a very famous intelligent design proponent. He says it has three parts. One is a scientific research program that investigates the effects of intelligent causes. Two is an intellectual movement that challenges Darwinism and its naturalistic legacy. And three, a way of understanding divine action. Well, one is plausibly a scientific explanation. We could debate that. Two certainly is clearly in the tradition of blaming evolution for all the bad things that happen. Um, Three is, is an out-and-out theological statement. So intelligent design is, is a complex idea that involves non-scientific ideas as well as uh, potentially scientific ideas. We don't really have time to talk about the science of intelligent design. Uh, I would like to assure you that scientists have looked at the scientific claims of intelligent design, claims like irreducible complexity or complex specified information, and uh, to make a medium-sized story short, uh, have found that these ideas do not help us understand nature. And they, are not, uh, they, do, not propose, they do not propose testable claims. So uh, nobody's really paying any attention to the science of intelligent design these days. And actually, theologians I know don't pay any attention to the theology of intelligent design either. But the history of this movement goes back to the primary institution of intelligent design, which is the Discovery Institute in Seattle. It began as the Center for Renewal of Science and Culture. And the fact that it began as the Center for the Renewal of Science and Culture is an interesting title for a, um, a think tank. It, it suggests their orientation as culture warriors uh, attempting to purify or improve society. Rather similar, really, to the Young Earth Creationists. And if you take a look at the evolution of the banner that they had on their website, you can see this, um, the, the origin of uh, sort of the culture warrior component uh, even more clearly. Uh, later versions of the website banner um, attempted to remove the religious overtones as much as possible uh, as the Center for Renewal of Science and Culture attempted to present a more scientific or at least a more scholarly foot forward. The very first version of the banner on the website was this Michelangelo creation, uh, which seeing that might make one think that intelligent design had something to do with creationism. They figured out that this was not working very well for them, so they got rid of Adam at least, and they have a, um, still have something of the Michelangelo approach here, uh, but God is reaching out and touching a double helix. A theologian friend of mine commented, that makes God really, really, really teeny. <laughs> that banner might not have been very well thought out either. Uh, so then they ditched Michelangelo completely and moved to a Hubble galaxy photograph. Uh, this happens to be one called the Eye of God, so they're still not straying too far from their, uh, from their roots. And uh, then they decided that referring to themselves as the renewal of science and culture probably wasn't making them sound very scientific, and so they dropped the word renewal. Their present-day banner, I don't know what it's all about, but it's got all kinds of stuff in it. But, um, 
But the evolving banners is not the only indication of an ideological opposition to evolution in the Discovery Institute intelligent design movement. From the very beginning of the Discovery Institute, saving society through Christianity has been the paramount goal. In the Discovery Institute Journal of 1996, Bruce Chapman, president, wrote, quote, for over a century, Western science has been influenced by the idea that God is either dead or irrelevant. Two foundations recently awarded Discovery Institute nearly a million dollars in grants to examine and confront this materialistic bias in science, law, and the humanities. The grants will be used to establish the Center for the Renewal of Science and Culture, which will award research fellowships to scholars, hold conferences, and disseminate research findings among opinion makers and the general public. The more you read about the program, and there will be about six books to read from the center in the next four years, the more you will realize the radical assault it makes on the tired and depressing materialist culture and politics of our times, as well as the science behind them. Then when you start to ponder what science and politics might become under a sounder scientific dispensation, you will become truly inspired. The phrasing here is very interesting. A scientific dispensation. If you know anything about Christian theology, dispensations refer to periods of time uh, and the relationship between God and humans. So a scientific disp dispensation kind of doesn't fit. Um, most scientists would find that very curious wording. So the ambition of the intelligent design movement was not to just assail evolution, but to promote a specifically theistic position it wanted society to embrace. But notice that not only society was to embrace the position, but science itself. The center seeks nothing less than the overthrow of materialism and its cultural legacies. And then over here, oops, sorry. The center explores how new developments in biology, physics, and cognitive science raise serious doubts about scientific materialism and have reopened the case for a broadly theistic understanding of nature. A very clear statement of this theistic understanding of nature, in other words, theisticizing science, if you will, comes from Philip Johnson, who was a leader of the ID movement during the 1990s and 2000s. I have built an intellectual movement in the universities and churches that we call the Wedge, which is devoted to scholarship and writing that furthers this program of questioning the materialistic basis of science. We need to unpack that materialistic basic basis of science phrase, because the way the ID people use it is very different from the way philosophers of science use it. There are two kinds of materialism or naturalism. Um, one is a methodological naturalism or a methodological materialism, which is the, call it a rule or a habit or a practice or something, it's the way we do science. We practice science, we answer questions wearing our scientist hat, if you will, through explaining through natural causes, material causes, hence the phrase materialism or naturalism. There also is something called philosophical materialism or philosophical naturalism, ontological naturalism if you're a fast budget philosopher of science, but philosophical materialism will do for us non-card-carrying philosophers of science. This is the idea that material causes, material forces, matter and energy is all there is. That there is no God, there are no ancestor spirits, there is no supernatural whatsoever, just material causes. Now, methodological materialism and philosophical materialism are not the same thing. I would feel quite confident saying that all philosophical materialists are also methodological materialists, but the converse doesn't work. One of the best methodological naturalists was Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel, of course, was the... Um, the, the uh, Austrian monk who developed the uh, principles of heredity in Mendelian genetics that we still use today. Uh, and he used solely natural causes to explain how the pea seeds grew and how they transferred their hereditary units and so forth and so on. And yet he certainly was not a philosophical materialist. There's this confusion that because, na because science restricts itself to explaining through natural causes, therefore Scientists are all atheists, which is not true, or science itself is atheistic. Well, science is non-theistic, but then so is long division, right? So is plumbing. You know, if, if you're 
toilet is leaking, you call a plumber, you don't expect him to say prayers. You expect him to you know, fix it through some sort of natural cause. So a lot of things in our life, uh, we, you know, a lot of problems that we solve, we do through natural causes. Um, we, you know, and, and we don't consider those atheistic practices. Yeah, I mean, or maybe plumbing is atheistic, I don't know. But most people don't really look at it that way. The reason why scientists restrict themselves to natural causes is not because all scientists are atheists, but because natural causes are the only kinds of causes that we can test. And science is all about testing your explanations, something that you should learn in a, any elementary science class. Hopefully you learned it in seventh grade. Science is about testing explanations against the natural world, um, holding constant certain variables so you can see <clears throat> whether your explanation really works, and tossing out the explanations that don't work and provisionally keeping the ones that do, rinse and repeat. And do this over and over and over, and eventually you lurch forward with a better understanding of how nature works. Now, when I say that science is about testing, hang on. Testing involves holding constant certain variables. What that means is that if there is an omnipotent God, there's no way you can hold constant God's efforts. As a friend of mine once said, you can't put God in a test tube. Another friend pointed out, you can't keep him out of one either. So you have to do science only in reference to natural causes because those are the only causes that you have any possibility of controlling or holding constant. You just have to set God aside and leave him out of science. My friend Bill Thwaites once commented that if we only had a theometer, then maybe we could test some of these explanations. But lacking a theometer, we just have to muddle along best we can with natural causes. That doesn't make science atheistic. It's a limitation of science. But it's one that's worked remarkably well, because we have discovered a great deal about how the world works by muddling along using natural causes. But that's not the same thing as holding philosophical materialism. My personal philosophy is philosophical materialism. But I don't confuse that with science. That's a different, these two are different concepts. Now what Johnson and other intelligent design supporters argue is that, is, as in his book, The Wedge of Truth, he says that society, which is materialistic, which is in a philosophical sense, this is philosophical materialism, he thinks he wants to change the materialist philosophical orientation of society. He believes that this is held up by materialist science. Again, philosophically materialist science, not the methodological materialism that is what science is actually about. And he believes that evolution is the, the most powerful scientific idea holding up this whole column. So in the Wedge of Truth, what he argues for is attacking evolution as a way of causing this whole edifice to crumble. If you attack evolution, that would mean that science itself, the materialist basic of, basis of science, is going to crumble and fall, which allows good Christians to attack materialist society and replace it with, in his terms, a proper Christian theism. So what the intelligent design people are talking about is not only promoting their particular view of Christianity, but also changing how we do science. They want to do away with the restriction of science, of restricting ourselves to methodological naturalism and allow in the occasional direct hand of God, which is really what intelligent design is all about. If you read their literature, one of the main concepts is something called, um, called um, come on, Jeannie, uh, Behe's, um, why did that just go out of my brain? Help, oh, what am I thinking of? Um, Behe's major concept of irreducible complexity. Whew. Man, talk about a senior moment. <laughs> That's all right, you'll forgive me. Irreducible complexity is a quality that some very complicated or very improbable structures have. And according to intelligent design, this is a particular kind of complexity that cannot be explained through natural causes. Therefore, it has to be explained through an intelligence. And the intelligence spells his name with three letters. First one's G. 
Um, so basically, what intelligent design is, is, is sort of a fancy hand waving of saying the direct hand of God specially created. But certain things. We're not you know, arguing for the special creation of everything all at one kind like you get with Henry Morse. But their argument is that we need to open science. That's their view, and it's a lovely term. We need to open science so that it becomes broader and allows in the occasional theological uh, introduction. I would suggest to you that that would be the end of science as we know it. Uh, gee, my crop isn't growing terribly well. Um, I've got this problem. Um, uh, I guess I'll just uh, assume that God doesn't want it to grow. You're not going to get that paper published. Okay. Uh, you, you, you really need to do the hard work of finding out a natural cause for why your crop isn't doing well. Okay, to return to the pillars of denial, I've been talking mostly about ideological opposition to evolution. Let me talk very quickly about some of the cultural values. Um, Americans treasure free speech. They treasure the ability to express opinions, the wisdom of every man. Town hall meetings are cherished. Question authority is a bumper sticker, not just found in Berkeley. Um, to accuse someone of dogmatism or being closed-minded or worse, not allowing others the opportunity to be heard, really goes against the American grain. So it makes a lot of sense for creationists to accuse evolution, uh, to accuse biology teachers or professors who only teach evolution and don't balance it with the teaching of creationism. Uh, it, it works very well to, cause, to call them closed-minded or dogmatic or um, uh, trying to restrict uh, knowledge and this isn't new. This is a clipping from uh, 1981. Uh, the young earth creationists were proposing that teaching creationism along with evolution is a matter of academic freedom. And in Texas in 2009, a state board of education member, a businessman, squared off against a Nobel laureate in a newspaper debate, but don't, ex don't assume that the laureate got the better of the battle. The laureate knew the science, certainly, but um, the school board member knew how to tap into these American cultural values much more effectively than did the Nobel laureate. Mr. Mercer's argument primarily was directed toward the cultural values of fairness, critical thinking, some scientific theories require critical questioning and thought. Well, sounds like a great idea. A particularly interesting manifestation of this approach is the spate of academic freedom bills that have been appearing since the early 2000s. Uh, in, the first one appeared in Alabama. It was called the Academic Freedom Act in 2004, and it was largely protective. If a teacher wanted to teach creationism or the evidence against evolution, uh, the school district, uh, had this bill passed, would not have been allowed to, to tell the teacher to knock it off. It was sort of a get-out-of-jail-free card, so to speak, for a teacher. Similarly, a student who subscribes to a position, in other words, you ask a student to write about evolution, the student writes about creationism, you can't grade him down. I mean, this is the sort of thing that would drive a teacher nuts. Uh, none of these bills passed. Uh, the legislator kept coming up with them over and over. Um, the, um, it, it was quite clear that the goal of the sponsor was to get creationism taught. The sponsor said, quote, this bill will level the playing field because it allows a teacher to bring forward the biblical creation story of humankind. So the whole purpose of getting these bills taught was to bring creationism in without calling it creationism. But this Alabama bill helped inspire a whole phylogeny, if you will, of academic freedom acts. Uh, the Discovery Institute wrote a newer version, which is still circulating today, and a Florida bill almost passed, uh, which was based upon a Washita Parish, Louisiana uh, foundation, shall we say. And I do want you to notice that there is horizontal gene transfer going on between these two different phylogenies of academic freedom acts. There's two general kinds circulating, but they have reinforced each other. All of them call directly on Americans' love of free speech under the guise of academic freedom and for the encouragement of freedom. As long as this is directed against evolution, global warming, and other supposedly controversial subjects. You know, you don't, you don't get any of that for things like sex education, but I digress. Um, let me just move on to this. Uh, Discovery Institute's um, academic freedom competition. Teachers should be protected from being fired, harassed, intimidated, or discriminated against for objectively presenting the scientific strengths and weaknesses of Darwin's theory. Students should be protected from being harassed, intimidated, etc. Uh, well, you know, teachers have, uh, you know, basically 
not really been persecuted for such things. Teachers are um, uh, called down by their administrators, or teachers get the school district sued when they bring creationism in, yeah. But these bills are just sort of backdoor ways of trying to encourage the teaching of creationism. I love the, um, the framing of this issue. It's always framed in ter terms of, let me teach. Don't hobble the academic freedom of a teacher. Let the teacher bring in alternative views. And in terms of the student, let me think. Why can't I be allowed to decide for myself what the truth is? Maybe because you're 12. <laughs> I mean, you know, does the earth go around the sun or the sun go around the earth? Let's let 12-year-olds decide. Um, no, that's kind of silly. The caption here is, uh, when little boy has written 2 plus 2 is 5, the caption is, maybe it's not a wrong answer, maybe it's just a different answer. Well, you know, when it comes to K-12 education, there are wrong answers, okay? The, the, the goal of a high school or middle school education is considerably more limited than what you guys are doing in college or than what uh, research scientists are debating and, and fighting about what the truth is, so to speak. Um, let me just give you a quick summary of these academic freedom um, evidence against evolution kind of laws. They tend to avoid any mention of religion. That's because all of the other creationist efforts have run right into the buzzsaw of the First Amendment and uh, they get whacked down by the courts pretty quickly. So they don't mention any sort of religion. What they argue is for alternative views, which is code for bringing in creationism, of course, without using the C word. Or they talk about evidence against evolution, and that is also code for bringing in creationism. They stress free speech, again, tapping into American cultural values. The bills tend to be protective. Um, a teacher who uh, uh, wishes to teach alternatives, in other words, creationism, is protected by these bills from being told to knock it off by the school district. This is because there was a series of court cases in the 2000s in which teachers taught creationism, were, taught by, were told by their districts to, to stop because they were violating the law, and the teachers sued the districts for their right, freedom of speech, academic freedom, right to teach what they thought was good science, and the courts uniformly decided, no, you have to do what your district tells you to do. A K-12 teacher does not have the academic freedom that a college professor has. And when you think about it, that's a good thing, because we want to have some continuity from school to school, from classroom to classroom. We don't want to have teachers just inventing things on their own. There is a curriculum. If you are hired by a school district, you agree to teach that district's curriculum. If you want to teach something else, go work someplace else. But if you are working in school district X, you have to teach school district X's curriculum. And that is what the courts have held. So a lot of these protective bills are trying to work around those kinds of, of uh, issues. They tend to be permissive bills. Permissive in the sense of they don't say teachers go out and teach evidence against evolution, go out and teach alternative theories. They say you may go out and teach um, alternative views. And this is the legal strategy, which we don't have time to go into. But it's based upon the general idea that it's a lot easier to get an injunction to challenge a bill on its face if the bill is directive. If the bill says, like the uh, resolution uh, or the, the um, uh, directive from the Dover, uh, Pennsylvania School Board, go out and teach intelligent design, uh, you can challenge that bill on its face. Uh, if it's just permissive, it says you can go, you can do this if you want. Then what most judges would say is, well, you know, let's, let's wait and see how this works out. Let's see if any teacher does it. If the teacher steps over the line, then we'll talk. Uh, and it's much, much harder to find the teacher who is stepping over the line, to find a plaintiff who has standing to sue. So making a permissive bill is a very clever legal strategy, and it makes it much harder to defend evolution. And the other thing that they do is they avoid, often avoid singling out evolution by embedding it with other controversial topics. The reason for this is an earlier court case in which it was shown that if you single out evolution for special treatment, that is basically evidence that you have a religious um, uh, uh, goal in mind. So basically what we have with the current creation and evolution situation is a continuation of a history where um, ideology is uh, very important, uh, conservative Christian ideology, but also um, ideology attempting to reform American society, 
to uh, make it more Christian, and also to reform in the sense of the intelligent design movement, to try to inform the reform uh, or change. I wouldn't call it a reform in a positive sense, but to try to change how science itself is done. And this is often done in the context of tapping into very strong and valid American cultural traditions of freedom of speech, uh, freedom of thought, and so forth, which is very popular in terms of selling these ideas to the general public, but which, when you stop and reflect upon it, are not really, not really appropriate for a junior high or a high school classroom where the goals of instruction are to give the students the basics, not to have the students wrestle with the cutting edges of a, um, of a scientific controversy. Uh, you know, it's interesting that so much of these uh, academic freedom acts and the other kinds of bills we're dealing with today are couched in terms of fairness. Be fair. Teach both. Teach evolution. Teach something to balance it out. Whereas I would suggest to you that that is the epitome of being unfair. For one thing, it's being very unfair to those scientists who have worked very, very hard to test their ideas and contend with one another in the conferences, in the journals, in the classrooms, uh, in the, you know, over a beer, uh, all the ways that scientists exchange ideas and try to build theories and test theories to explain nature. And finally, 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 after oftentimes decades of work, a consensus slowly arises around a principle. In terms of the principle common ancestry, the big idea of evolution, that consensus is very well established. Now what happens is that for ideological reasons, sometimes for political reasons, outsiders of science are coming in and saying, but wait, we want to start all over again. We want to go to the high school, to the junior high and pretend to students as if there's no consensus. We want you to pretend that 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 hard research that was used to establish these ideas and and come to a consensus view within science can just be set aside and doesn't count. That, to me, is grossly unfair. It's also grossly unfair to students because any student taught that at the high school level is in for a big surprise when they show up at this institution or any other institution of higher learning. Let me put it this way, any well-respected institution of higher learning. That would include Baylor, that would include Brigham Young, that would include Notre Dame, that would include uh, Texas Christian, that would include all of the well-regarded sectarian institutions as well as all the secular institutions. Because you go to the university level and evolution is taught matter-of-factly in both secular as well as well-regarded sectarian institutions. So that is grossly unfair to students to pretend to them and have them leave high school thinking that there is a controversy within science that is not happening. Let me give you some suggestions for further information if you're interested in this topic. NCSE.com, a very easily remembered URL. Uh, If you go to this little button over here where it says News Alerts, We have a Friday electronic newsletter. It's done by Glenn Branch, our deputy director. And it's sort of what's happened in the last week. Uh, It's just quick two or three buttons, very easy. You can skim it over, and if you want to uh, explore more, there's generally links for uh, more information. The news button here will take you to this page where you can find out what's going on either by year or by state. I often show this slide when I'm speaking at a university because many students give papers on topics like this, and this is a great place for you to uh, get some very basic um, background information. And we are a membership organization, so do consider uh, joining and supporting us. My staff and I are at ncse.com. Glenn Branch is the deputy director. Robert Lunn is the head of communications. Peter Hess is our Religious Community Outreach Director. Uh, Josh Rosno and Steve Newton are our flare-ups wranglers. They're the ones who um, answer the phones and uh, try to help people cope with these uh, problems, legislation or classroom problems. We all do to a great extent, but these two guys are really on the front lines. Eric Mickle is our Education Director, and uh, the new guy, Mark McCaffrey, is the head of our Climate Change Initiative. He's a climate scientist. Do check us out on YouTube. Uh, There's far more 
YouTubes of me than anybody in their right mind would ever possibly want to watch, but um, there's other good stuff to see as well. Uh, that's Steve G. Gould holding Honk If You Understand Punctuated Equilibria, which is fabulous bumper stick. The chemists are going, what? <laughs> And, of course, uh, we are also on Facebook, and I am on Facebook. And if you want to be my friend, please go to eugenie.scott, because there's several uh, YouTube, excuse me, there are several Facebook pages of Eugenie Scott. This is mine. This, this is the only one I actually update. So if you'd be so kind as to go there, if such is your interest, you would, um, you'll get my occasional updates, including a cup that I took a picture of at lunch today, which is a very interesting cup. But We'll talk about that later. Anyway, I've had a wonderful time these, uh, today at um, uh, Saginaw Valley, and uh, I thank my hosts for their graciousness in inviting me, and you for being such a very attentive audience. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We'll let you decide if there is time for questions. He says there's time for questions. Are there any questions? In the back. Um, uh, first of all, I like to thank you for being here. That's very, I uh, get a lot, lot of things to think about here. Thank you. And growing up and, and evolution and, and uh, that's what I really want to school. But ended up being a teacher. Now, some of my colleagues are um, uh, creationists and uh, even worse, intelligent design people. <laughs> and so they will ask me some questions like this, and if you could, if you would comment and take a couple of them or something, one would be uh, unconformities, where you got a tree trunk going through layers of millions of years of data material, this is one, I said these have not been uh, answered, and say before the Big Bang, where the original material came from, that type of thing, I don't have an answer to that one, but a couple of real quick that I really have come back. If the DNA, you see a mutation. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I couldn't even remember um, irreducible complexity until a while, so don't make me think. Don't make me remember too many things in one row. Um, let me let me give you. Let me teach you how to fish. Okay, you know the story about. You know, I'm not going to feed you a fish. I'm going to teach you how to fish. Talkorigins.org, all one word. Talkorigins.org is a website that has a ton of commentary on creationist anti-evolution claims. Uh, you will find, uh, by the way, it's not uh, unconformity. Un unconformity refers to a lost geological stratum. What you're talking about is polystrate trees, trees that, that grow through more than one thing. That's in there. Um, the, uh, probably everything else on your list is also in there. So go to talkorigins.org. The other place to go for um, information uh, on uh, creationist claims, especially intelligent design claims, is pandasthumb.org, which is a blog uh, focusing primarily on intelligent design. That's written at a rather higher level. There's often all discussions of molecular biology and other stuff that a lot of goes over my head. Um, but talkorigins.org is a really great place to start. Your question about what happened before the Big Bang, that's not a scientific question. If the Big Bang, as most, you know, seems to be... Uh, um, the general case, and physicists feel free to, to, to correct me. If the Big Bang is the origin of matter, energy, and time, science can only deal with matter, energy, and time. If there's anything other than matter, energy, and time, that's outside of science. So I think at that point, you're more in the realm of philosophy or religion. And philosophy and religion can have a fight about that. You mentioned two on the papers, and the teacher asked for papers, I think the specific thing I was talking about would be an exam, where if a teacher was asking students to, if a teacher was assessing student knowledge, and a student just uh, sort of blew it all off and said, no, I hold this point of view, you know, most teachers would say, I'm sorry, you have to answer the question. 
you can't just you know, rattle on about something that you're interested in if I want you to talk about this on this test. Um, what teachers feared in Alabama is that if that bill passed, uh, a student might challenge the teacher uh, in a situation like that, which is not the sort of thing teachers really want to fool with. I mean, basically, what these anti-evolution bills do is they intimidate teachers. And so teacher just skips evolution, which of course means the creationists win. Because the goal is to not get evolution taught. If it is taught, then it has to be balanced by the teaching of some sort of creationism. So, next person. Thank you. You're welcome. I, uh, I teach evolution in anthropology and physical anthropology. And I find it works very, it works very well. First of all, talk about the nature of theory. Uh, theories are not true or false. They're either adequate or inadequate to explain a bunch of facts. And I say the theory of evolution is constantly being revised and updated and so on. And we talk about science as one source of knowledge. There being others. Uh, but it's one. And especially I say that uh, I don't care whether you believe evolution or not. I'm going to teach you what science says about evolution. I want you to know it and understand it. To be an educated person. The moon is made of green cheese. I don't care. You know, uh, all I'm going to do is test your knowledge of this theory. It's not about belief. I mean, religion is about belief. Science is about how, how, how the universe operates. Religion is about the meaning and why. Yeah, really. So you, know, you know, I, I really don't think that people lining up at a school board meeting uh, protesting the inclusion of evolution in a curriculum are really doing it because they care so much about the Cambrian explosion. I mean, they do it because they feel that their religion is being attacked, and religion is about meaningfulness. It's about who I am and my relationship to the cosmos, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's, you know, there are many, many views of that kind of meaning, including secular ones, including humanist ones which don't rely on the supernatural. And that is where the contention is. What I hate to see is that particular argument, that particular culture war visited on the science itself. Because the science is what it is. Uh, it is either valid or it is not valid. It is either supported or it is not supported. And if you are going to have a coherent theology, which my theologian friends tell me, it has to be consonant with the natural world. It has to be consonant with what we know about the world. At one point, it was a matter of great concern within the Christian church, whether the earth went around the sun or the sun went around the earth. And this was a big deal. Uh, ask Galileo. A couple of folks had kind of a tough time with this. Uh, you know, geocentrism uh, was a, a major concern for Cardinal Bonaparte. And you can find some, some really interesting quotes uh, about the dogmatism, so to speak, about the earth being the center of the cosmos, because that's how he interpreted the Bible. Very few Christians interpret the Bible today as requiring that the earth be the center of the cosmos. Maybe in a couple hundred years we'll get over the idea that um, living things uh, require some sort of special intervention to, exp uh, to explain their origin. Perhaps we can uh, use religion for this idea of, of purpose and meaning that you were talking about, rather than trying to explain the natural world. Because unfortunately, when it comes to explaining the natural world, science really works. You know? And revealed truth doesn't work as well. It's not very testable. Yes, sir. Is there, are there any instances in which fundamentalist Muslims and fundamentalist Jews have supported the fundamentalist Christians in supporting the teaching of uh, creationism? The question was, what about um, fundamentalist Muslims, fundamentalist Jews, uh, conservative, you know, uh, literalist Muslims, literalist Jews? Um, they, they don't tend to join ranks in the United States, but in Great Britain, uh, teachers are feeling definite pushback because of uh, Muslim students in their classes who don't want to learn about evolution. And unfortunately, what the Brits are discovering is that even though they're not, you know, they, they don't oppose evolution. I mean, Darwin's their guy, right? I mean, this is the, you know, he's, he's on the ten dollar, he's on the ten pound note. Uh, it's not that they're anti-evolution, but they don't know very much about it. And so when the teachers are sort of faced with this uh, Harunyaya kind of uh, literature, uh, anti-evolution literature that the Muslims come up with, 
um, the teachers are really kind of hard pressed to know what to do, deal, how to deal with it. So they're finding that they really need to do a little better job on sort of basic science. Um, in Israel, there are problems with the teaching of evolution, as um, as opposition from the um, uh, ultra orthodox. Uh, uh, but but they generally tend to have their own schools, so it, it hasn't affected uh, education. Although there are occasionally little ripples come up where they ask to have the Shanadar and the other Neanderthal fossils reburied. <laughs> it sort of sends chills down the spine of any physical fellow physical anthropologist. Yes, sir. You mentioned the idea of keeping God out of the text tubes, if you will. Um, well, it's not a preference. You can, there's just no way yeah. you can. <laughs> um, what do you think of the anti-theist idea that God and certain well, I, I am hard pressed to figure out how you can test the um, uh, an omnipotent force. I mean, the whole definition of God is an omnipotent force. And so, how do you possibly test? Um, you you can test uh, logically or rational certain um, certain uh, conceptions of God. But then that conception could be highly idiosyncratic. You know, if, if you believe that, that um, you know, God is uh, six inches tall and lives under that chair, I can test that. There's no God six inches tall living underneath that chair. But that's a pretty idiosyncratic definition of God. Okay? And nobody else agrees with that definition of God. Um, you, you can define certain definitions of God and then, you know, like Vic Stanger does, uh, then destroy them. But they're irrelevant if you're a believer. Uh, I just think that, frankly, acceptance or rejection of God is a first principle. And to try to say that you can prove the existence or non-existence of God through science is just not very careful philosophy of science, in my opinion. In the back. very important to realize that the conservative Christian community is not monolithic on this. Um, there are evangelical Christians who accept evolution. Uh, they need to do a better job getting the message out to their brethren, to, to people who agree with them religiously. Um, a place where, if you're interested in this, um, uh, there's a website uh, the American Scientific Affiliation is a science and religion organization, been around since the 40s, uh, very respected. Uh, you have to have a master's degree or better to be a voting member, but you can be a friend. and You can also just go to their website without being a member, obviously. And on their website, you'll find a lot of discussion of science and religion issues, including creation and evolution. Now, you have to be an evangelical Christian to belong to the ASA. And... Um, so they're all, you know, they all are born again. They have all heard the good news. They all have a personal relationship with Jesus. The whole, they're evangelical Christians. Theologically, they're quite similar. Most of them, most of them accept evolution. And if you are a conservative Christian, it might be worthwhile visiting their website. It's asafree.org. No more free. asafree.org. And just see what these folks say about how they accommodate conservative Christianity to evolution. Um, just like there's, you know, just like there are green Christians who uh, accept global warming, who um, are uh, embracers of stewardship rather than dominion theology, so there are evangelical Christians who accept evolution. Now, it's not a matter of the scientific community pushing back. You know, we as scientists can shovel all the science we want on somebody who doesn't accept evolution and it's just going to roll off. Um, the only way that you are going to, in my experience, 
get somebody to listen to the scientific arguments is if that person has assuaged his concern that if you're right, I'm not going to lose big. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, if, if I feel that if evolution is true, my whole world disintegrates, I have a lot of good reason to keep my fingers in, in my ears. I have a lot of good reason to come up with reasons why you can't be right, no matter how much science you throw up. But if I'm talking to a fellow uh, evangelical Christian who accepts my religious point of view, but he accepts evolution or she accepts evolution, this is very curious. So maybe I can listen. So I, I wouldn't say it's the responsibility of the scientific community, except for those you know, members of the scientific community who share that particular theological view to take this message to people who are resistant to their evolution. But more importantly than that, I mean, what NCSE's concern is, is that science and evolution be able, be permitted to be taught unqualified, shall we say, at the K-12 level that we should not be restricting the teaching of evolution, modifying it, balancing it, doing, affecting the integrity of scientific instruction. Uh, we need to be able to teach good science uh, for any number of reasons, uh, including uh, maintaining American competitiveness and keeping the pipeline of scientists full. Um, that is our major concern at NCSC. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, especially since it's in the Michigan standards. Sure They're shortchanging the students now, aren't they? So what's with, what's with Darwin and religion? <laughs> to take the latter one first, send your colleagues to the ASA website because they're not going to listen to you. But they might listen to somebody from that religious tradition. There's a lovely article. Yeah, when, when you you are probably not a conservative Christian that you know is a biblical literalist because you do accept, and but they are. And there's a wonderful article on the ASA site, which talks about radioisotopic dating, all the different kinds of dating, why they um, they correct each other and they overlap in terms of the uh, periods of time that they. Uh, cover and how you can cross-check different uh, uh, specimens and strata and stuff. You know, it's 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 valid. It's valid. Um, about Darwin and his religious views, um, another little source of, of uh, usefulness for people dealing with this issue. The um, Answers in Genesis website has a uh, page on it: arguments creationists should not use. And one of the arguments creationists should not use is Darwin's deathbed confession, because it's wrong. It never happened. Darwin never recanted on his deathbed. And if even the creationists say that, you can have confidence in it. Darwin um, was raised in a free-thinking family. Uh, his uh, grandfather, Erasmus, was clearly a free-thinker, uh, didn't believe in the church. His father, Robert the physician, um, wasn't religious either. His mother uh, did go to church. Um, his mother died when he was seven or eight years old, so he didn't have a lot of influence from his mother. But his older sisters bundled him off to church. And it was considered that, yes, the children should go to church because um, um, the church was also a uh, component of social mobility and uh, in order to get any place in the sort of the class that the Darwins were, Darwins and Wedgwoods were, um, were in and, and expected to remain in, um, you needed to have uh, Church of England, uh, 
population. His mother actually was a Unitarian, which was kind of a lefty kind of uh, uh, Christian denomination. So Darwin was actually raised in the Church of England. He had a very conventional religious upbringing. And when he went off on his trip uh, around the world on the, um, on the Beagle, uh, and sometimes the soldiers would, would la- uh, the, the sailors would laugh at him because he would you know be quoting Bible verses to them and they just thought that was silly. <laughs> so, but so you know there, there's plenty of evidence that that uh, the the voyage of the Beagle did not um, uh, uh, make him give up his faith. Uh, he was um, he was he saw a lot of things on that round the world voyage clearly that uh, made him question some of the biblical literalist aspects. But really, you know, biblical literalism had been fading from the Christian church, Catholic and Protestant, for over 150 years by that time. Uh, It actually came back in the American Christian church in the early 20th century in the whole rise of fundamentalism, but that's another bit of historical information. But, you know, the Church of England was not a a hardcore biblical literalist, six 24-hour days kind of church. And so, you know, the biogeographic relationships that he saw, which suggested it didn't make sense for there to have been just one creation, and would there be centers of creation, you know, all this kind of stuff was, was burbling around. But uh, he certainly did not reject um, the Christian faith. Later in life, he grew away from the Christian faith. There's no specific evidence that his understanding of evolution and his crafting of natural selection and common ancestry and the ideas that he expressed in um, his many books. There's really no evidence that that pushed him away. It seems more that um, the doctrines of the church uh, were more offensive to him than the idea of God itself. Um, So he did withdraw from the Anglican church. Uh, in his autobiography, he talks about how he, he never really liked the idea of damnation because according to the doctrine of damnation, his father and grandfather would be uh, cast into hell, and that is a damnable doctrine. Um, there is some discussion by historians uh, over whether the death of his beloved daughter Annie, a very painful death when she was 10 years old, uh, he doted on Annie. They He loved all of his many, many children, but he had a special bond with Annie. And uh, he was just devastated for um, years um, at her death. And the question of theodicy, of why is there evil if God is good, um, which is kind of a crude way of putting it, but it's a long-term Christian um, uh, theological conundrum. Uh, The question is whether... Uh, that, you know, why did this innocent girl have to die if God is good? I don't believe God anymore. You know, maybe that was part of his withdrawing. But later in life, it seems that although he, he stopped going to church, um, he didn't seem to be very interested in organized religion at all, but many of his um, uh, writings, letters to people, correspondence, suggest that he was something of a deist, that he just felt that there is something... Um, behind it all, but basically his was a mechanistic world, a sort of a Newtonian mechanistic world where natural causes were sufficient to explain everything. You didn't need miracles to come in and explain the natural world. So he certainly was not an anti-religionist like Thomas Henry Huxley. Huxley was um, right out there arguing against religion. That was not interesting to Darwin. So his personal religious beliefs were probably complicated. He was not a church member after middle age or so. Uh, He seemed to reject organized religion, uh, but he probably still retained some sort of belief of what today I guess we'd call a higher power, but not anything that would be clearly recognized as the Christian God. One more question? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I would, the, the question is, what about the teaching of creationism in a social studies class? Uh, as an anthropologist, I think it would be wonderful for comparative religion to be taught in maybe junior or senior year of high school. Um, you, much younger, it would be more difficult, I think, because kids tend to not be able to kind of pull back and be objective. 
But, you know, we talk about the lack of science literacy in the United States, and that's real. We also are theologically literate. We, we don't know much about religion. We think we know something about Christianity, which is the majority of religion in the U.S., but we don't even understand the varieties of Christianity out there. There's a huge range of attitudes toward evolution within Christianity, much less the other world religions, much less the tribal religions in Native Americans, uh, Sub-Saharan African, Southeast Asia. There are lots and lots of religious views that human beings have come up with. And I think it would be very good for creationism's plural to be taught to students. Now that's very different from saying this view is right, okay? which is what is being promoted by the anti-evolutionists who want creationism taught in science class. They want a particular religious view to be advocated as true. What I would argue for, and I think would be a great idea, is for an understanding to be communicated to students about the importance of religion in human history and culture, and uh, why it is that this particular set of behaviors about a non-material reality, if you will, um, that all human societies tend to have, um, what is it that makes this idea so adaptive that it is found in all human societies? But also the huge variety of views out there of what people call religion which has to do with meaning and purpose, and to some degree, in some religions, some explanation of the